A very good evening to you all and welcome back from your Easter Sunday. This is Easter Monday and this is the hot seat here on 93.3 KFM this evening. I'm your host, Judith Atim, sitting in for Patrick Kamara, who returns on Tuesday. That's tomorrow. And with me in the studio is an incredible guest, retired Major General Mugisha Muntu, former presidential candidate and founding leader of the Alliance for National transformation. He's also a former UPDF commander. Major, you must, General, you most welcome to the show. Thank you, Judith. Good to have you. My pleasure. And uh, what have you been up to lately as an individual and as ANT as a party? I had taken a break for about two months or so. So I have uh, just started re-engaging in the activities of uh, the party and uh, public activities about a week back. Mm-hmm. Yes. And how is that so far? Well, I mean, it's the challenges that uh, we face as a country. We clearly understand that there's a, a burden we have to carry, that we have to keep on doing th- the things which are necessary to be done to see how we can salvage ourselves as a people, as a country. So it's a task uh, that uh, is challenging, but uh, we have to apply all effort and time. Mm-hmm. To ensure that we get out of the vicious cycle of uh, uh, poor governance. It's a 24-7 task. <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, in the 2021 general elections, you, the ANT did not perform well. And um, I'm sure this set you back in a number of ways as a party. But also yeah. it brought up a lot of learning and moments for yeah. reflection. Yeah. And um, we are now seeing some activity from your side as a party. We're seeing some press engagements lately from yeah. uh, some members of the senior members of the party. But could you just tell me what your experience was like after the elections? What has it been like for the party? One, by the time we engaged into the 2021 20, elections, we were just about uh, one year old. Mm. We managed to feel about... Uh, 270 candidates for MP and also, of course, the presidential candidate. At uh, my level, carrying the flag, I knew I had no chance. I could see the dynamics. Mm-hmm. The competition was between uh, the incumbent and Honorable Chagurani in, of, of NUP. So I didn't have uh, a lot of expectations in terms of uh, winning that election. Uh, however, I knew that uh, we were sowing seeds Clearly, our message was unique. And uh, since then, we keep on propagating that uh, message. And therefore, it was a worthwhile involvement and engagement. It also opened our eyes to uh, the responses, because there is nowhere in the country where we walked into any form of resistance. Mm -hmm. So we got good feedback, recognizing that people were appreciating our message, but at the same time saying that we we didn't have momentum, <laughs> which is another problem. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, people seem not to recognize that if they think you're doing, doing the right thing, but they see that you don't have momentum, that they are the ones who create that momentum. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a contradiction mm-hmm. in regard to that. But at a mental level, we could have uh, got about 10, between 10 and 15 from our own estimation, mm-hmm. but we were targeted at parliament. Mm-hmm. Clearly, deliberately, there are many members of, par- there are a number of members of parliament who are clearly rigged out. S- deliberately, we, we know what the plan they had because they wanted to deny us visibility and also to deny us resources as a lands for national transformation. Mm-hmm. However, we got 50 uh, candidates through at uh, the lower local government levels. The highest one being LC5 chairperson of Terego. Mm. And then we also have some LC3 chairperson, some mayors, and also councillors LC5 and LC3. Mm. So about 50 on a you know, countrywide. And immediately after elections, we went back. We made a, a tour around the country, met all our candidates who had run. 
those who made it, those who didn't make it, of course, those who didn't make it were in the majority, had uh, uh, did uh, conducted uh, analysis of or a review of what we had gone through and also preparing the way forward. Mm-hmm. Immediately after that, because before elections we had only made uh, uh, tours to four districts where we were building grassroots structures. Uh, Bugweri, uh, Serere, Namaingo, yeah, yeah, basically those, and then of course Terego, where Honorable Cassiano Adri was. Mm. And we recognized that where we had worked on the ground, that's where we had a significant number of uh, successes at the local government level. And uh, therefore, after elections, we continued with that exercise within the limitation of resources that there were. Until now, that's what we concentrate on. Mm-hmm. Disseminating the message that we, you know, what we stand for. And also the key element of uh, trying to influence the thinking and the mindset of the Ugandan people about the cause of the problems that we have gone through for 60 years. Mm-hmm. That's what we are still grappling with. Mm-hmm. That until we get one organization or two whose dominant force within it, because normally you have tendencies in, in all organizations, in all ruling parties or opposition parties, there are always tendencies. Until we get a dominant tendency in one singular party which happens to take power, and that tendency weighs in favor of those who want to do what is right, those who are uh, value-driven, those who, by conviction and ideological inclination, recognize that if you are talking about transparent management of resources, that that's what you are, that's what you stand for, that's you are convinced. From your that, very core. <coughs> that you will talk, you walk the talk. Mm-hmm. If you are talking about justice, if you are talking about fairness, if you are talking about equal opportunities, that that's what you practice. Any organization that succeeds in building that in itself is the organization that will transform this country. There is no other route. Mm -hmm. That's what we concentrate on. And then we hope that when we succeed in doing that, that by influence, the population will start holding all of us accountable, those who are in parties. And that therefore parties will recognize that, you know what, if we actually do not subscribe to and are consistent in practice of what we represent that we are going to be punished by the population. That's what we keep working on 24-7. Mm-hmm. Tough as it may seem, mm-hmm. we know that's where the solution lies. That's what we are still on now. You know, we keep propagating that information and also keep doing things which are necessary to attract people who are like-minded, who want to practice that in politics, that we build that critical mass within the party. Of leaders. Well, Major General, uh, sadly and shamefully, our politics is heavily monetized yeah. and it only gets worse every election yeah. time. Yeah. And I know ANT is really constrained. Yeah. A party is so young, yeah. does not have the kind of resources to yeah. throw around. And I'm, I'm sure even if you did, even if we had based the on the values that you have, you yeah, wouldn't. You wouldn't. wouldn't. No. But how was it like navigating this t- terrain during during the the last election season? We've always been open when we were in campaigns. We tell people that even if we had money, we wouldn't give it to them. Mm-hmm. And we ask them, why should we give you money? Mm-hmm. Because you should uh, elect leaders who are going to go there and manage your taxes. Create conditions that will enable you to make money. Mm-hmm. One, any party which gives out money, even if it is in power, there is no government that can sustain the needs of people by giving out cash. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's, so it's a question of changing mindsets. Even now when we're building, we go out there in the population. Most times people expect that, you know, any, any, any political party which goes there will give the money. We tell them, mm-hmm. we're not going to give you money. Even if we had it, we wouldn't give it to you. Why? Because we want to attract people who know that, you know what, I am going in not because of what I expect from this party, but mm-hmm. I want to build it, be part of the solution, and create conditions that enable me to make money. Mm-hmm. That's what 
you know, uh, politics should be about. Mm-hmm. That any party which takes power creates the necessary, the, the uh, conducive environment that enables people to apply their effort wherever they can apply their effort, whether it is doing a job, whether it is uh, building a factory, whether it is in the service industries, that you're able to make money. How on earth can anybody even think, you know, which is also a sense, which can, at times it can really become almost frustrating, that you can find a population where they expect that they can live on handouts. How possible can that it's be? It's not sustainable. Because in any case, wh- how much money are they given? 2000 5000 Once. Imagine in five years. Mm-hmm. And then you go to hospital. You find there are no drugs. And then if you are going to have treatment for uh, malaria, they maybe know, it, it yeah. costs you about 100000 So you have ended up making a loss. <laughs> because if you had the responsible governance, then you'd have found uh, drugs which are... Required, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, and you'd also find, the medical you'd, personnel you'd find, uh, at work. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, efficient health delivery services. Mm-hmm. That's what politics is about. Okay. But you are driven by quick, quick, you know, a quick emotion of, of getting something. <laughs> gratification. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. So Instant gratification. As, as we head to 2026, what plans do you have going forward? We have resumed uh, last year. We stopped uh, uh, tour in December touring districts. We had uh, done about uh, t- around 1215 districts where we are building our branch networks at uh, the sub county and the parish and the village. Mm-hmm. And now we are engaging starting this uh, month. And, and hopefully by the end of the year, we should have uh, gone beyond. Uh, we are targeting to go anywhere between 70 to 100 districts by the end of the year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When you, of when course, you, dependent on uh, on uh, resource availability. Oh, okay. Yeah. So when you look at our population, the demography, majority are young people. Yeah. And uh, those are the pe- that's that's the vote that I think every party is actually running to capture. Yeah. What strategies are you employing to actually get into to actually attract more young people to the party? By recruiting first uh, those who uh, can develop uh, through their spheres of influence more young people. Mm-hmm. If the party is open, we, we have branch networks in universities, even at uh, uh, the areas where we go. We have got a youth league branch. At the, Our intention is build youth uh, league branches at village parish, at sub-county. Mm-hmm. So we target influential youth those who stand for the values that we subscribe to. Mm-hmm. And then through uh, dissemination of our message. And also, hopefully, when we get resources, there are projects we, won't, we need to target. Not not in a wide scale, not on a nationwide scale, but uh, uh, projects that would uh, send a signal as to what we would want to do in regard to the youth mm-hmm. youth issues. Mm-hmm. And the, the ultimate solution is the message. Because the youth need to understand that they are 75% of the population, those mm-hmm. who are under 35. And therefore, they need not even see themselves as a special group. They are the dominant group. Mm-hmm. And therefore, they should be able to influence politics at all levels mm-hmm. in all parties. Mm-hmm. So once we make a breakthrough in that regard, and therefore, the youth understand that, the mindset. Because in numbers, they are the majority. But in terms of participation, they are a minority. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's what we need to break, that thinking. To recognize that, you know, if they uh, apply their effort, they influence policy across all the parties. Because there's no party where you find that they are not in the majority. Because largely, across the whole country, mm-hmm. under 35 or 75 percent. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and uh, 15, I think, 52 percent. So something which is going to be ongoing for quite a while. Mm-hmm. So we have to keep on communicating to the leaders of the youth that they should not look at themselves as a marginalized group to have a minority mindset that they are the majority in numbers and that therefore they should get the best out of them, the generation to offer leadership at different levels for us to be able to shape the future mm-hmm. in a manner in which they desire to. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So since 2021, we've actually had a number of by-elections yes. in different parts of the country. Yeah. But we've not seen that presence of ANT. What could be the reason for that? Most of the by-elections we've gone to, we've gone to areas where we hadn't bro- bro- uh, Broken built, ground. Uh, built on the grassroots. 
that any day where there is going to be any by election an area where I've built uh, branch networks on the ground, there will be a significant show mm-hmm. for us. The only area, of course, where, where, where there was already a leader was in Serere, but of course the Serere by election was so messed up. So the outcomes were really manipulated. We could see the the manipulation of the ruling party. Nevertheless, we are not perturbed. We keep doing what we believe is necessary to be done, the building of the infrastructure and the ground, mm-hmm. and also want to do a number of things that would project the party and also uh, influence public perceptions about us. Mm-hmm. There's also something we, we intend to do in that regard. When, when, when we get the necessary resources, we'll be doing that, and it would do the things which we believe... Uh, will happen by projecting the party for people to understand what we stand for and what we are able to do because of the organizational capabilities we have. So the biggest challenge that we face now is resources. So there's a, there is a project we intend to go into in regard, of, in regard to mobilizing the necessary resources to put behind the projects that we intend to carry out. Okay. Yes. Thank you, uh, General. Let's take a break and then we'll return with more questions and um, the discussion, of course, takes another cause in, 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 in in the second part, which is after the break. Okay. Welcome back from the break. Uh, this is still the hot seat here on 93.3 KFM. My name is Judith Atim. I am sitting in for Patrick Kamara. And with me in the studio is none other than retired Major General Mogisha Muntu, former presidential candidate and founding leader of the Alliance for National Transformation. He's also a former UPDF commander. We've been looking at what he has been up to and what ANT has been up to especially in the in light of uh, how the party performed post-2021 elections and also what the party is focusing on as we head to 2026. Now, um, uh, General, we have seen uh, the recent reshuffle by the president. Yes. Uh, where the first son, General Mohozi Kainerugaba, has been promoted to the rank of Chief of Defense Forces, the second most high rank in the military after his father, of course. Yeah. Um, in 20, well, his rise in the military has definitely dominated public discourse over the years. I remember in 2013, this publication got closed down. We were shut down for 11 days. It was quite traumatic when the military, <laughs> I still remember I was going on air to read news and yes. uh, the raid was here, all these plain clothed poli- um, security people. And this was, of course, after Monitor published the dossier that was penned by a retired General David Sejusa. Yes. He called it the Mohose Project, <laughs> which was aimed at seeing the first son take over the presidency from his father. And uh, General Sejusa also got himself in problems because of that. Now, as a former army commander, what do you make of these changes, especially in an institution where you once planned for and uh, led yeah, of course, it's it's unfortunate the way things are unfolding. Because uh, General Mohose has now been uh, made uh, the CDF, mm. which I would have had no problem with if it wasn't that he had been involved in uh, another project of being promoted to be the president of the country, or Mm -hmm. being projected, which in in itself I wouldn't have had a problem with if it wasn't that he was breaking the law in pursuing that project. Because laws are very, very important. Respect of laws is very, very important because at the end of it all, we are all protected by the law, whether you're in government, whether you're outside of government. So when you operate in a manner that promotes lawlessness and it becomes a culture, it becomes a weakness in that society or in a country like in in this particular case. Mm -hmm. Here you have a law that specifically requires any officer who's going to get involved in politics to retire from the army to get out of uniform, as we did when uh, the Maripote dispensation came to be. Mm -hmm. 
all of us who wanted to go into politics had to retire, including Genom Seven himself. And then you get it at a time when Genom Mozi was being projected uh, through uh, the birthday parties all over the place, and voices were raised, indicating how that was uh, undermining the law. Genom you know, Seven, who is the commander in chief ignores those voices. General Mohs, who had an, op- an opportunity to project himself as different from the commander-in-chief by taking a stand, a firm stand, and say, I am interested in politics, but I don't want to break the law. I must get out of uniform. Because he could have done that. Had he done that, I have a feeling that he would have sent a strong signal or an understanding that the, 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 this uh, general seems to be different from who happens to be his father. Because mm. I tend to separate uh, the two. The, the two. Mm. Because a, a son does or a daughter does not necessarily have to be like the father or the mother. True. I mean, we have seen, we have seen uh, uh, cases where father, I mean, f- uh, sons or, or, or daughters turn out to be like the fathers when the fathers are good managers mm. of organizations, political, social, Economic political, even businesses. countries. Yes. We have seen that happen. Mm-hmm. But also seen sons or daughters who actually are good when the parents were really poor at managing whatever they were managing. I mean, we see consistency like in Singapore, Ali Kuan Yu was, a, you know, uh, mm. someone who was uh, um, very, very instrumental in lifting Singapore where it was and world. took it to the, from third yeah, world to first, first world. world. And then yeah. the son happened to get into power, and consistently he maintained the same track. So Mm -hmm. both were good. Mm -hmm. So I I see no problem in regard to that. So I I would have thought that General Mohosi would have wanted to project himself as different. (laughs) He turned out to be no different from General Mm. Mseveni. I think that's why I have a problem. Now, unfortunately, when that project failed to take off, now he's propelled to CDF. CDF. Mm. Basically promoting lawlessness. Because that's the signal that Genom 7 is sending out the public. It's not good for the country. It's not good for the political culture in this country. Mm. And, 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 and worst of all, it is <laughs> it's arrogance, basically. Because it's basically telling the whole country that I can do anything, then there's nothing you can do about it. Mm. What kind of 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 of, of <laughs> situation do you want to create? But that's up to him because he's an individual. The moment any leader loses direction, they'll continue until something stops them. Mm-hmm. So the 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 board has always been in our court. Those of us who want to see better management of a country. One, not to lose hope, because Genome 7 does all the things he does for psychological warfare purposes. You know, you do things in such a manner that you break down the will of the people, you create a sense of hopelessness, so that people give up and say, there's nothing we can do. And therefore, those of us who want to see better management in this country, one, the first thing is not to lose hope, to remain steadfast, and to keep on organizing, and to ensure that that culture is broken, and that the country goes back onto track. Is it easy? Many times it's never easy. But do we have any other alternative? We don't. Because we have 45 million people and we're increasing in numbers. And therefore building a foundation on the basis of which there is respect for the law. There's justice, there's fairness, there's you know, equal opportunities mm-hmm. and other uh, values that we subscribe to. We have to keep working day and night to build those. So the, 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 the elevation of, of General Mohose as a CDF certainly is, is within the mandate of the commander-in-chief, but it's a wrong signal. So the question is what the rest of us keep doing to ensure that this culture of impunity does not continue you know, getting deeper and deeper. I don't agree with people who think that, ah, there's nothing you can do. How? General Mzeven, he can do whatever he wants to do. He has pulled it off a number of times. But at the end of the day, he's not the Alpha and the Omega. He's not God. Mm. 
and 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 that is a, that is a, a fact mm-hmm. and and consist we have seen consistently elsewhere leaders who have tried to do the same thing and 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 um, they don't succeed mm-hmm. so we so, have to keep working one amid all those challenges that we see we don't lose hope and we keep on doing all things which are humanly possible to ensure that because change happens change is inevitable that how do we operate in a manner that we keep on recreating hope and building and strengthening it so that the counter force that is built around hope can participate in how this country can move back on track and hopefully move back on track through a stable change mm-hmm. i mean we we have to keep focused on that and do everything humanly possible best case scenario it succeeds that way worst case scenario even if it didn't succeed to be stable but that we would not blame ourselves at least you know you did that something. we did all things that were humanly possible okay yeah so still in light of other reshuffle when you look at now the cabinet reshuffle we're having a lot of young youthful faces yeah Uh, being appointed to these cabinet positions, some with very to be very close associates of the first son. And uh, this is also coming just two years or less to the next election, so, uh, to yeah. the next general elections. What, what are your views <coughs> in regard to this, um, this, this kind of move? Well, it's consistent with what Genome 7 does. Manipulation, deception, manipulating the public mind, Is, is, is consistent with how he has managed to hang on to power this long. The only problem that I always have in regard to that is for him to think that the longer he stay in power, the more it signals success. <laughs> you know, you can only be considered successful when you manage power, however long you are in it, so that by the time you leave, that there are strong institutions, there are functioning systems, and that this, uh, 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 the country gets better and better. But we have seen countries where leaders spend 40 years, even some 50 years, and the moment they leave power, the country implodes. <clears throat> and unfortunately, Genome 7 seems not to understand that uh, his legacy is not, be, not going to be counted on how long he has stayed in power. It's going to be counted on <laughs> what happens in how power changes hands and what happens even when he's out, because being out, he will. I mean, it's one way or another. Mm. In, he, he, I hope he'll, he'll reach a point when he recognizes that. And therefore, elevating uh, ministers and sending a signal to the public that, you know, uh, this is a, a group that supports, uh, I think they called it PLOU or whatever it was called. Mm. Uh, and therefore, influencing the public mind, yes, is trying to influence public opinion. And those of us who believe that that's the wrong direction to go, we have to keep organizing to mobilize counter political forces, not only to impede that, but also to neutralize it. Because at the end of the day, you can never depend on the goodwill of any individual. We have to depend for the stability of the country, for sustainable economic growth and development on institutions and functioning systems. Which Genome 7 has no understanding of. You know, he's a micromanager. The principle of separation of powers, for example, is an alien concept to him. And that's why he does all things necessary to break down parliament, break down the executive, so that he can remain as the only uh, pillar, seemingly, for stability. But in the process, actually, working potentially for an unstable situation down the road. On that note, General, let's take a break. And when we return, let's talk about the general political environment <coughs> and what we are seeing happening in our opposition political parties and what exactly it means for the, bro- the broader governance and democracy of this country. Okay. Welcome back from the break. This is still the hot seat here on 93.3 KFM. I am Judith Atim, your host. I'm sitting in for Patrick Kamara, who is away on leave, but he'll be back tomorrow. Uh, with me here, I have a retired Major General Mogisha Muntu, former presidential candidate and founding leader of the Alliance for National Transformation. He's also former UPDF commander. Before the break, we were talking about uh, recent developments in uh, cabinet, the reshuffle that saw um, a new, new faces taking on cabinet positions, but also the first son being 
are promoted to the rank of a chief of defense forces. Um, Honorable, sorry, uh, General, let's now talk about the political environment of this country. You've been following events in the Forum for Democratic Change Party, which you formerly belonged to, and now uh, events that are happening in the National Unity Platform. And also prior, uh, some time back, we also saw what was happening in the Democratic Party. Before you, you left FDC and went and formed ANT, you also had several challenges. Mm. And um, could you just take me through what your experience was like in FDC at that time? Accusations that you were planned in the party, (laughs) you were a mole in FDC, and so it kept on playing out every time someone was talked to, oh, you know, Muntu is a mole in this party. Um, Just tell me, share with us what, what it was like for you. When we formed the Forum for Democratic Change, and, and uh, the name itself suggests, our main focus was to build uh, an, an internal democratic organization. And then we're also hoping to build uh, its identity around uh, good governance issues. But the, the, as all parties tend to be, there were tendencies. And we had the belief that we could manage those tendencies until a point when we'd be able to take power, and then the party would keep on uh, doing the necessary reforms wherever we would find weaknesses. At least to me, that was my understanding. Mm -hmm. There there emerged uh, a a tendency which was focusing more on regime change than building an institution that would rather in self in how to manage power when it takes it. And the two are not in conflict. And therefore, there are people who almost were doing things and our identity as a party almost seemed to be around being able to remove the dictatorship. Mm. And I kept on asking, you see, we have to build our own identity as an organization whether Genome 7 is in power or not, that the party would have its own identity so that everybody would say, we trust that organization because it, we think it has got the capabilities to do one, two, three, four in the interest of the public. So there were contradictions in that internally within the organization. But one thing that I am proud of was that one thing I participated in were the internal elections Mm -hmm. because I participated in five, lost four, one in one. And therefore, to me, even when there were differences in strategy, because there are those who are believing in uh, uh, street actions as a way of removing government, we believed in building the foundation of the party grassroots up and therefore building the capability to remove the regime in whichever uh, strategy would be applicable. Mm -hmm. I had no problem in having contradictions in terms of strategies. But I knew that we were building capabilities in terms of internal democratic practices. But when, when you look at what's happening, do you feel exonerated? Well, y- y- you know, <laughs> eventually, unfortunately, people were focusing more on the short term than the long term. Mm. So I participated in an election where he lost. I lost. In all the uh, elections that we were engaged in, I was standing on one uh, tendons, uh, the, no, the, the strategy of grassroots structures and preparing the organization to have the capability to manage power in the event that takes power. Mm-hmm. The other colleagues who are saying these issues of, of what you are talking about are theoretical, let's go on the streets, take power, and we'll resolve the problems once we we'll solve that. Mm-hmm. So all the time I ran, the four times I lost, I lost on that uh, 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 a platform. Mm. And all the colleagues ahead of us stood uh, uh, with, competed with, were all for defiance. defiance. So in, in 2017, defiance won. And I recognized that. And I congratulated the winner because I believed in internal democratic prices and also believed that the party should survive. But also knew the background of the contestation was really very, very fractious. One, I knew that I wasn't being trusted because people were saying I was simply an agent of Genome 7 within the organization. I could have withstood that 
at the top leadership of the party and kept on holding the party together because I knew one thing that I would keep practicing was fairness. And that is exhibited by, you know, one, when I, I lost Dr. Chiza Besje, he had come in from outside and he competed on as the president of the party. He won and we put, I put the party behind him. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When I lost to Honorable Oboy, I was the sitting president. I had uh, the whole of neck, 70% uh, of neck behind me. I could also have influenced uh, rigging of both elections, by the way. Mm -hmm. Most people don't understand that. Mm -hmm. They don't even recognize that. But because to me, the survival of the party is important. was more important. That's why every time I would lose, I would concede defeat. Mm -hmm. I'd go behind the one who would have won. Mm -hmm. Now, the difference in 2017, I knew that there was no way I was going to continue operating within FDC to influence that culture. <laughs> more so with what was being thrown at me in the process of the election. Mm -hmm. So I recognize that we need to do, go and do an assessment, which we did over eight months, and reach the conclusion that if we remain in FDC, the fights are going to continue and FDC is going to remain paralyzed. Therefore, even those who have taken over will not manage to build around the strategy they believe in, which was defiers. I but called uh, Honorary Patrick. I said, you know, we have done our analysis. We need to meet. We met and we gave him a document of our analysis, the, the, the findings, and our conclusion. Said we will separate. But we need to separate smoothly. Mm -hmm. Ask to have a, a two-person committee to manage the, 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 the separation process. Unfortunately, it didn't happen. So it was incumbent upon us to manage it on our side. So now, much as we were under flag for six months thereafter, we kept quiet and the turbulence subsided and we continued building alliance for national transformation. Well, we see this <coughs> playing out in the national <coughs> unity platform as yes. well. Um, there, there are signs that the party could actually split, although when you speak to either camp, everyone says, no, 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 it is not going to. But the writing is very clear for all to see when you follow the exchanges that, that, are, that are actually playing out in social media and in the mainstream media. Um, what would you advise a young party like NUP with um, a youthful leader like Chagulani and um, the differences they're having with uh, Honorable Matthias Mpuga? What would be your advice? One, they have uh, several advantages to, their <clears throat> to themselves as a, as a NUP. One, they have got 57 members of parliament. That's huge. Mm. Two, they have got resources. Now, the unfortunate thing is that uh, they have slugged it out publicly. That's not, you can't change that. They cannot, uh, you know, ch change Re that undo, now. Yes. It can, they can't undo it. It's already happened. So what they have to do is uh, create an environment internally, completely behind uh, locked doors, get elders who subscribe to their thinking, and they have got a number of them, who can be respected by both sides. I know there are many uh, elders who are supporters of NUP. They go and thrash out these uh, contradictions. Mm -hmm. And best, can, best case scenario, for them to be able to resolve them and get back on track and continue growing the party. Mm -hmm. But even in the worst case scenario, if they find that uh, the contradiction they have are irreconcilable, they need to agree now to manage it for their own good as a party, but also for the good of all of us who are in the opposition. Because mm -hmm. when you create a situation where people lose hope, it affects all of us. It will affect them, it will affect us. Mm -hmm. So they need to make that conclusion now. Cease fire, go behind closed doors, if they are going to remove their jackets, fold their sleeves, and fight it out inside that in that uh, room, whatever it mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. But when they come out, whatever they would have agreed upon, let it remain there. And Two, speak with one voice. Yes, speak mm -hmm. with one voice. If it is separation, let them manage the separation smoothly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because, you see, another thing that <clears throat> we all have to know who are in the opposition. Whenever they are human beings, there are going to be a difference of opinion, there are going to be contradictions. So you have to learn how to manage those contradictions. And the earlier you learn them when you're in the opposition, the better you are positioned with the skills on how to manage power when you're in power. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I mean, if, if you are not able to resolve contradictions when you're outside power, when you're in power, you have weapons at your disposal. You have, you know, state resources. So if you don't learn the skills early enough, when you get into government, you'll be 
tempted actually to uh, abuse the instruments of power that are at your disposal. On the, thank you. Yeah. On that note, let's take a break and then we'll come back and discuss something else after that. This is the hot seat. Welcome back from the break and uh, thank you for choosing 93.3 KFM. My name is Judith Atim, your host, and this is The Hot Seat. I'm here sitting in for Patrick Kamara, who is away. He'll be back tomorrow. And I, with me, I have uh, retired Major General Mogesha Muntu, uh, founding leader of the Alliance for National Transformation Party, former UPDF commander and... Um, is also a former presidential candidate. Before we went into the break, we were looking at uh, the general political environment and the developments in our opposition parties, the Forum for Democratic Change, the National Unity Platform, and so on. And uh, don't forget, at one point, uh, General Muntu was in the Forum for Democratic Change, after which he moved to the national to create the Alliance for National Transformation. Now, General, in the last part of our conversation, let's talk about public expenditure a little bit. Yes. It's also another issue that has been playing out a lot in the media. Issues of accountability in the House. Um, the, the budget cycle is on and um, right now I think Parliament is looking at a budget of 50 something trillion to finance the, the yes. coming financial year. But also we know Parliament has also been on the spot for this heavy budget and heavy expenditure and people asking where does the money really go? Does it add value to us? Um, or is it just spent on luxurious living and so on? Um, what What is your view in in light of the proposals or the budget estimates? I think they're putting it at 58 or so trillion shillings. What, 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 what do you make of this? What's happening in the area of uh, expenditure at the level of those in uh, government and even in terms of, say, parliament and all leaders really is a reflection of the culture in the political elite. And that's an, an issue that we need really to uh, shine light at. Because, you see, that's where therein lies the solution. But the question should be, what motivates us who are in politics? And where is the balance of forces? Where does the balance of forces favor? Mm. Right now, as we speak, the balance of forces is in favor of people who are motivated by self-aggrandizement. That's a fact. And people don't understand that we are products of our own society. So we are a reflection of where we are at as a people. Does that mean that the majority of Ugandans are corrupt? No. <laughs> and that's where the dilemma is. There are many Ugandans who would want to see things done right, who would want to see accountability, who want to see fairness, who want to see justice, who want to see equal opportunities. But the majority of them are not engaged in politics. Without resolving that, you're not going to get any solution. Corruption will continue intensifying. Mm -hmm. Mismanagement of budgets is going to remain. Why? Because it's the motive. Any leader who is in a position of responsibility, what motivated him or her to go into politics? As we speak now, the highest motivation is self-aggrandizement. Get into a position of responsibility if you get the opportunity and further your nest. That's the culture. Mm -hmm. And it, it cuts across board. <laughs> you know? So anybody who wants to crack that has to keep highlighting that until people reach that realization and say, you know what? If we want to resolve this problem, we have got to ensure that those who want to do what is right, those who are value driven, let's get into politics and shift the balance of forces in favor of people who want to do what is right. And that's when you bring in accountability, you bring in the, the, the values of equal opportunities, justice, fairness. There is no other way out of that. And the PSST's proposal to slash the budget of parliament by 50%, which has actually caused a lot of a huge uproar from parliament, legislators and the speaker as well. Um, do you think such a proposal is feasible? <laughs> First, parliament takes a cue from the executive. The executive, the, 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 um, Jerome Seven is the worst example for frugal management. He just uh, spends money as if it is from his own pocket. It's like his money. He doesn't care about 
checks and balances. Accountability for national, the use of national resources is an alien concept to him. And it has now taken root in parliament. So they can talk whatever they want to say. They can put in place measures that they want to, to put in, as they, as, they, as they say, publicly. But that's going to be on paper. The practice is going to remain the way it is. It's going to worsen before it gets better. Mm. I don't see any way out. Whatever they say, because <coughs> change this situation is not what you pronounce. It's not what you even put down in regulations or in laws. No, it's the practice. Mm. But who are the players? The players right now, as we we speak, the the the, 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 the dominant uh, number of people who are in politics are there for themselves, not for the country, not mm. for people. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, what would be your parting shots in light of um, all these discussions we've had from um, the public expenditure bit, the political developments in in, in our pos- opposition parties and the reshuffle? Just if you could just give us as your concluding remarks. Ugandans, men and women of integrity, men and women who want to do what is right, who want to ensure that there is a firm foundation on the base of which this country can be led, who want to see justice, who want to see fairness, who want to see equal opportunities, how to engage in politics, either direct or influence politics, mm. so that we have a team of leaders in the vehicles of governance, because parties are the vehicles of governance. Build the critical mass in parties of leaders who, when they get into power, they'll do what is right. You cannot avoid doing that and hope that by some accident things are going to be done right. That's not possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Whatever we saw is what we are going to reap. If we have leaders who are driven by, by greed... <laughs> That's what we shall get. They'll go there and loot. So what? What? what is... Why, why should people even be... Uh, screaming as if they don't understand the cause of this. They need to change the culture of politics in this country. There are many Ugandans who want to do what is right. The only problem is they're sitting on the fence. Get off the fence, get into parties. Influence the parties, the direction that they take. And then you can influence the politics of the country. Because there's no party which will give what it does not have. Thank you very much, General. It's, Welcome. It's, it's been a pleasure having you, and we hope to have you another time. Pleasure, well, that Judy. also wraps up this edition of Hot of the Hot Seat. My name is Judith Atim. Thank you very much for listening in. Catch you again next time.